homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. This is a question and answer session specifically on the Karaniya Metta Sutta on the practice of cultivating loving kindness or metta. The question is, is there such a thing of being too extremely kind and caring about the smallest of creatures to the point you become too cautious and it becomes difficult to do your daily work? If so, how can you overcome it? Now this question came in from one of our younger audience during one of our sessions on the Karani Metta Sutta. And it was very encouraging to receive this question because it actually points to the fact that this particular young person has actually taken on board the teachings of the Buddha around loving kindness, around metta. And what you can actually glean from this question is that as she has purified her conduct, whether it's through body, speech or mind, she's starting to realize firstly that she doesn't want to harm any living beings. And then secondly, most likely as well, is that she's starting to understand the law of karma, that whatever we do has an implication, a result of, of that action. And pretty much uh, when you think about the sutta where Buddha teaches about the creeping, Samsapaniya Sutta, then you remember that Buddha says that if you have crooked conduct, whether it's crooked through body, speech or mind, then the result will be crooked kamma, and therefore you will have a crooked result and a crooked rebirth. And you would be reborn either in the, the hells or you would be reborn as an animal that creeps, one that shies away and, and turns away and runs away basically when it sees humans. So there is quite a profound change when you actually start to understand that and to understand the gravity of the situation. And so the question about not wanting to harm extremely uh, small animals, small creatures, that uh, comes from a place of um, a bit of understanding of that. And then to question whether can we be too extremely kind and caring that it would prevent us from doing our daily work. I mean, this is always a challenge. This comes when you realize that every step you take potentially kills that every breath you take potentially kills. And when you contemplate and investigate that, you wonder, well, all of this would, would mean that I would um, break my sila, my virtue would be compromised. And so this question often comes up when it comes to the Buddha, that he would answer in a particular way that would be quite helpful for people to understand around that. And that's what we'll go through in answering this question. But to the point about daily work and, and difficulty, I think it's a heartening thing to know that one's virtue is being refined constantly by doing the karaniya metta, by doing the cultivation of loving kindness in an authentic and genuine sense, by purifying one's conduct. And through that purity, the, the thoughts that one has is purified. And therefore, one's wisdom is also uh, developed and it, and it grows. So you have this Adi Sila, Adi Chitta, and Adi Panya, the higher virtue, the higher thought, the higher concentration of mind, the higher wisdom. Now, when it comes to daily work, this could refer to even household work, things around the house, things as we go about our life, but it can also re refer to livelihood. And I think when it comes to livelihood, there is a greater consideration that needs to be made towards what kind of jobs do we do because that puts us in the vicinity of danger when it comes to killing living beings. Uh, so for example if you have a gardening job then you know that when you mow the lawn if you really look at it then at every instance you are killing and it may not be your intention but as part of your livelihood every day you are actually having to kill. Likewise, a fisherman, a butcher, uh, working at an abattoir, um, and those sorts of uh, jobs that entail killing. Now, I think if you have a choice, and early on, particularly if you're young, if you have a choice, then you would try to choose something that doesn't put you in those situations 
and you're not even attracted to doing those kinds of jobs because you actually understand uh, the noble truth of of death actually that the suffering of of killing uh, comes when you really understand marana you understand death and you don't like to kill and you don't like death and so when you uh, link that together you actually see marana pidukha you understand it not just for yourself but for all living beings and so you wouldn't choose that kind of job so if you're young it's a case of really assessing what kind of job would put me in a more skillful environment where i don't have to break my sila and that includes not just killing but other parts of one's virtue when it comes to dasa kusala the skill states and when it comes to daily life i think also you pick and choose because as we'll see later on there's a sutta about uh, contact and about the different kinds of things that impact on kamma and contact is one of those things where if we make contact then the opportunity arises for us to go the bad way through our, our conduct but we also have a choice to go the good way but contact is the is the distinction that with contact comes choices and whether you make a wise choice as in nipako the prudence uh that is the distinction really and that's where it gets quite difficult that one has to actually know the difference between kusala and akusala the skillful and the unskillful and then to actually make the right choice at that point so we'll look at a few more things we might go look at uh, the dasa kusala again and just have a look at what we can glean from that if we revisit the dasa kusala or 10 skilled states or 10 wholesome conduct we have physical action which includes refraining from killing living beings refraining from taking what hasn't been gin- been given or stealing refraining from sexual misconduct or if you take that higher that's misconduct with sensual pleasures then you have the four uh, wholesome verbal actions which is refraining from lying or false speech refraining from harsh speech refraining from divisive speech and refraining from frivolous speech and then with mental action it begins with right view non ill will and non covetousness so with these skilled states what's really important to recognize are a number of things and and one can contemplate it in a different way so with killing you know this is really understanding the suffering that comes with killing that and and that comes with death Now if you really penetrate that then it's easier to actually refrain from killing living beings because you actually understand. So for example, a person that hunts as a hobby, hunts animals uh, either with a bow and arrow or with a knife or with a, another kind of weapon like a gun or rifle. That kind of person who does it as a hobby has some kind of ignorance that doesn't understand a number of things firstly doesn't understand the suffering of killing that it is killing a living being and with that comes death and there's no glorification of that secondly doesn't understand the karma of it the gravity of when you kill there is a result of that killing and it can be very very dire that uh, you could be reborn in hell realms um you could be reborn in animal realms which is again subject to a lot of fear that when you don't understand killing that you don't understand how much fear is there when you're a living being being born into that kind of realm or even the the, the amount of suffering that would would occur if you're reborn into one of the hell realms or hungry ghost realms and so that's a real contemplation that to really understand that if one takes joy in killing like the example of a hunter not apprehending the gravity of that then one needs to really contemplate investigate and see that through because if you do then you would actually refrain from killing now the same thing goes with stealing that if you don't understand jati bidukha that birth is dukha then you would constantly steal and stealing in terms of taking what's not given is not just in the mundane sense it's actually coming to another mother's womb because 
If you really think about it, the mother's womb is not actually given. You don't go to a mother and ask permission for that. You don't go to a couple and ask for that. It's actually something that you take. And apparently, it is said that the Bodhisattva in his last life is the one that doesn't steal because of the uh, causes and conditions that when a Tathagata comes, that in the final uh, time as a Bodhisattva, that uh, it isn't that he steals the mother's womb. It's actually probably given that the person that will be the mother of the Buddha, the mother of the Tathagata, has made a noble intention and has made an invitation. And so there's something quite different about that. But for all of us, the rest of us, we don't ask permission and therefore we are taking what hasn't been given. And so when you actually contemplate it in that way, that is very, very profound. It takes it to a much higher level of virtue when you see that. And so when you contemplate wanting to come back because of something you see, something you smell, something you hear, something you taste, something that you experience from a physical sensation perspective and therefore in the mind, you actually really start to think, do I really want to do that because I actually will be taking something that hasn't been given if I want to come back into a mother's womb. And we don't really look at it in that way, that we haven't been asked to look at it in that way, but it's important to do so because it starts to open up what this really means about Dasakusala, this skillful state. Now, when it comes to Kama Sumi Chachra, refraining from sexual misconduct, refraining from misconduct with sensual pleasures, then what we misapprehend is actually Jara Pidukha and Biyad Pidukha. So that old age or the aging process is Dukkha. We don't fully apprehend that. And Biyad Pidukha is illness, is suffering, is, is painful. We don't fully apprehend that. Because at every turn, what we do when it comes to sensual pleasures, is we take them. We take them and we glorify them and we indulge in them, not having a mind to the aging process, not having a mind to even getting sick. Now, our predicament in the world right now is really getting us to look at uh, sickness as pain because having loved ones go through sickness and even leading to death, uh, it's really quite piercing to our to our minds and to our whole well-being, we actually start to question a lot of things and hopefully in a good way because most of the time when we take sensual pleasures, what we do is we indulge the point of excessive wanting and then we think that we're getting sukha, that we're getting happiness, but it's actually quite temporary and when our toys in terms of these sensual pleasures are taken away, like when we're locked down or when we're not able to go and do these things, you really find that those things are really quite temporary and as much as we keep trying to grab them, when they're not available to us, we know that that ground that we're standing on is quite precarious. And so in that way, uh, when we go towards something that we find agreeable, uh, where it is subject, what we find is it's subject to vipranama dukkha, subject to painfulness and change, when it, when it ends, when it goes away, and something that is disagreeable, well, what we, we meet is always the painfulness in pain. It's, it's very unpleasant to the point of actually quite harmful to us. And that's something that we need to contemplate when it comes to sensual pleasures, that we can't abide in sensual pleasures. They don't give us lasting happiness. And so Buddha always encourages us to actually see through jara pidukha, biyade pidukha, that the, the aging process, the sickness, these are painful things for us to contemplate, for us to balance our view, for us to correct our view, really. And then when it comes to the speech, again, you know, there are ways of also looking at it when it comes to uh, refraining from lying or false speech. What we're actually seeing is we're being truthful about Dukkha, that we really start to penetrate the first noble truth. We stop fe uh, feeding um, this misapprehension and thinking that everything's great because actually not everything is great that it goes through twists and turns and we always experience something that is unpleasant and so it's really to contemplate dukkha in that way the correct way and to really see it for what it is and then when it comes to harsh speech 
you know, what we misapprehend or what we don't see, what, what is covered for us is we don't see that when there is harsh speech, we don't understand that the person on the receiving end of harsh speech, how difficult that is, how much sadness comes when someone is on the receiving end of that, that we hurt them and they go directly into sadness and sorrow. And that sadness brings a lot of unhappiness, but we don't see that when we lash out, when we think we have the right to do so, and when we think we're justified in doing so. And that's another way of contemplating it. And then when it comes to divisive speech, we don't understand that uh, as we compare and measure when it comes to, I guess, divisiveness itself, uh, there is this measuring and which is better than another and so that comes out in our speech that we don't understand the sorrow of it that we box things but we don't understand that we're actually um, not seeing the suffering of even that that there's a great sorrow when we compare and measure that we're always polarized in, in what we're doing there's a duplicity in it as well and so that's another contemplation and then when it comes to sampapalapa frivolous speech uh, this is really coming from a sense of Nietzsche. Whenever we talk about frivolous things, we always assign a permanency to it, that this is true for one thing, but this is permanent. So when we talk about people, we talk about situations, we assign this kind of permanency to it, but it's not actually true. And we actually talk out of the sense of uh, great uh, lamentation, that it's something that we can't actually hold on to. And so we're actually lamenting when we speak out in this way. And it makes no sense actually when, when we do that. And we also create a lot of lamentation in other people when we're doing that and creating a lot of wrong view as well. And so it's very important to actually examine where that actually comes from. And then when it comes to mental action, then you know this uh, right view is very, very important, but what we misapprehend when we uh, don't have the right view is actually the wrong view. And this comes from a, a place of not getting what we want, that each time what we are not seeing is that we don't get what we want. If you remember, Buddha says, Yampi chang nalabadi thampi dukkang. We don't get what we want at every turn. What we want is actually not to um, grow old, not to get sick and not to die and not for any of these things to happen to our loved ones. And so when we don't see that yampi chang nalapati thampi dukkang, that we don't actually get what we want, then this micha uh, is is enabled, activated. But when we really contemplate it truly in that predicament that we're all in, then right view starts to grow, it starts to activate and expand. And that's really important. And then when it comes to abhijja, then um, when you have this uh, non-covetousness, what is covering that is the abhijja itself, the coveting. And what we do is we always go towards what we like and what we dislike, that whether it's peer or peer, that uh, we don't want to be separated from what we like or what we find pleasing, what is beloved to us. And we also don't want to be united to what is displeasing, what is uh, unpleasant towards us. And so through coveting, we try and control that. We try and control our conditions. We want what we find beloved and pleasing. And we don't want what we find uh, un unpleasant and displeasing. And so coveting actually is the way that we normally go through towards sensual pleasures, that we try and control that, we try and manage our lives in that way. And that's what covers up covetousness or non-covetousness. And so that's another reflection. And the final one is really around uh, ill will, that ill will covers up the non-ill will, that we don't understand the despair that we have every time that uh, things don't go our way that if we have certain expectations around conditions, that when we perceive something as, as worthwhile and valuable, we go towards it, but we get disappointed after a while. At every turn, we, we, we need to examine that because when we see that and we start to despair 
then we realize that non-ill will is the place that needs to be cultivated, that from right view we can cultivate non-ill will. Through non-ill will as well we have non-covetousness. And so that, that is what we're cultivating. And what you see is with physical action, we're actually trying to cultivate bhavitakaya, which is development of the body. And in doing so, what we're seeing is that we can't hold on to form. And when we actually see that, then we really make a strong determination for truth. And if we do so, then we get this chanda samadhi, we get this um, samadhi, this concentration that comes through will. And it becomes much, much deeper when we concentrate in this way. Likewise, when we're developing the wholesome verbal speech, the skillful verbal um, actions, then this is bhavita sila. This is really the development through virtue. And what we're, we're seeing is that we can't hold on to any kind of experience or feeling, the vedana, that what we get is actually dukkha, domana, sasoka, parideva. We get this pain, sadness, sorrow, lamentation. And so when you understand that the speech comes from all these um, reactions to the feeling, that you can't hold on to happy feelings, pleasant feelings, then you realize again you make a noble uh, determination for the truth. And in doing so again, this concentration comes through will and it's much deeper and it's, it's real truth. And the, the fourth part is this mental action. When you start to correct the mental action, you're really developing bhavita chitta, which is the development of the mind, and bhavita panya, development of wisdom. And when you do so, you really see that these perceptions that we have out of wrong view, out of ill will, out of covetousness, we can't hold on to them. That uh, these are the wrong aspects, the wrong path. And so... When you really see that, you make a strong determination for truth again, this Satchaditana. And again, you develop this Chanda Samadhi, which is this uh, concentration through will. And when you do so, um, it really gets quite deep and opens up the Noble Eightfold Path in a quite amazing way. So this is another way of meditating, actually, uh, that I've included in answering this question a little bit more. But... Um, quite useful as a practice. Another aspect to answering this question about killing living beings, small creatures in particular, is this uh, Dhammapada verse, which is uh, the first verse actually. And it's about the story of Athera Chakupala. And in this uh, story, the Buddha was staying at Jetavana Monastery in Savati, and he made reference to Chakupala, a blind Thera. So on one occasion, Thera Chakupala came to pay homage to the Buddha at the Jetavana Monastery. And one night while pacing up and down in meditation, the Thera accidentally stopped or stomped on some insects. And in the morning, some bhikkhus visiting the Thera found the dead insects and they thought ill of the Thera and reported the matter to the Buddha. The Buddha asked them whether they had seen the Thera killing the insects when they had answered in the negative. And the Buddha said, just as you had not seen him killing, so also he had not seen those living insects. Besides, as the Thera had already attained Arahanship, he could have no intention of killing and so was quite innocent. On being asked why Chakupala was blind, although he was an Arahant, the Buddha told the following story. Chakupala was a physician in one of his past existences. Once he had deliberately made a woman patient blind. That woman had promised him to become his slave, together with her children, if her eyes were completely cured. Fearing that she and her children would have to become slaves, she lied to the physician. She told him that her eyes were getting worse when in fact they were perfectly cured. The physician knew she was deceiving him, so in revenge he gave her another ointment which made her totally blind. As a result of this evil deed, the physician lost his eyesight many times in his later existences. So the Buddha actually um, declared this verse. He said, Mind is the chief forerunner of all unwholesome states. Experiences are led by and produced chiefly by the mind. If one speaks or acts with a corrupted, impure mind, suffering will follow just like the wheel of an ox cart when the ox pulls. 
So um, this this um, teaching is very very helpful when it comes to small beings that uh, we may kill through breathing, through stepping, through even in our jobs. That it's really important to clarify our intention. That through our intention, we don't mean no harm. We mean not to kill. And in doing so, this is where that we need to actually start to practice and refine our sila. Now, the distinction needs to be made about this blind thera because he was clearly an arahant. So the Buddha's words are that he would have had no intention at all to kill. But in our case, it's not so clear because we are seekers, we are learners. And so we need to be very cautious about how we intend, how our volition comes in terms of certain things. So I'll give you an example. If you have a pet, like a dog or a cat or any other kind of pet, and it strikes out at you just by, say, a cat, it, it, it swipes its claws at you just from playing and it hurts you. If one is not careful because one is not an arahant, then if it's automatically, you might actually uh, swipe back. And it may not be very, very heavy, heavy kind of um, harm to the, to the animal because it's your pet. But it may be that you actually do strike back because that's the automatic thing. Someone hurts you, you hurt them back. Likewise, when you are walking in a place, you might carry a stick. Um, because you don't want to be harmed but even carrying the stick is actually saying if someone comes at me I'm going to strike them so even in self-defense that's still an intention to harm and so when you look at one sila it's really good to start to assess and analyze where is my intention where is my volition coming from because that is where it really begins and the opposite of that is when you really have intentions to kill, like a hunter, like someone who uh, works in an abattoir, um, or when you have a pet but you actually don't think, consider them pets, you actually like to kick and hurt and all those kinds of things. That is the complete opposite of having a wholesome intention. And so you can see that there is an actual sliding scale of this. And as seekers, we need to keep refining until we really see the the truth of firstly the karmic impact of killing but also in many ways to put ourselves into the shoes of someone that is being harmed or killed now if it's an animal for example you know that there is tremendous fear that comes with that that if you are a small animal that is being hit or pulled or or like say for example you pull a, a cat's tail or a dog's tail that is not something that they would find very pleasant and if you take up a, a more grave kind of um, arms towards an animal then one doesn't see the suffering of that and there are grave consequences for that the suttas actually say that the, the kamma of harming taking arms or a weapon against another living being is actually to invite sickness in in future lives that if you are reborn then you will be sickly so this is another way of actually looking of how we can practice uh, to actually start to refine our sila that if we come to correct our view that it can make a whole difference and of course there are things that we need to do in our jobs that if we have no choice then at least have an intention not to kill but when it happens that we actually regret and so when it comes to even walking breathing our intention is very clearly not to harm but we have no choice when we walk and when we actually breathe there are some instances when we walk that we can actually look quite carefully but there are also unseen creatures that we would harm and so it's very important to uh, clarify our intention and if we do see that we harm even the smallest of creatures to actually regret and to wish them well that uh, you know by regretting at least three times then it actually is very helpful towards um, lifting lifting the the harm that we do to ourselves in terms of that karma that we have made and then finally I wanted to just highlight the Nibedika Sutta about penetration and this is in the Anguttara Nikaya chapter 6 discourse 63 this is very useful sutta because it talks about different aspects of 
uh, sense pleasures, uh, kamma, dukkha, and uh, things that help us to actually look more clearly. And so this particular excerpt from the sutta is actually about kamma. And the thing again is it actually says that intention or volition is kamma. So whatever you intend, one does by body, speech and mind. And so it's very important. That's why one needs to refine one's intention or volition and actually not put ourselves in danger of situations where we can create more harm. And so the second part, what is the cause of kamma? Well, contact is the cause of kamma. So that's why when it says um, skillful livelihood, you don't put yourself into a position where you are constantly coming into contact with things that you have to kill. That's in terms of skillful livelihood or even everyday life. So for example, a very practical thing is that if you have a propensity to kill cockroaches, then it's a good idea to ask someone else to come and help you with that so that you don't actually kill, but someone who is able to deal with it in a more skillful way can actually do so. And, and in that way, you start to practice and you start to develop and you start to refrain from even contact with things that make you want to kill. And there are other aspects to this, this uh, part of the teaching about that the diversity of kamma is around deeds that lead to rebirth in hell, animal realm, ghost realm, human realm, and the world of the devas. So there are certain types of actions that lead to a good destination and there are certain types of actions that lead to bad destination. And then the re result of that is if one hasn't um, released oneself from sansara, then you would arise in uh, this existence, you would have some ripening of kamma in this existence. And if not this existence, then the next one and thereafter, uh, there on after that. And then lastly, the cessation of kamma. The Buddha says that it comes with the cessation of kamma, that you no longer make kamma. And therefore, um, actually, it actually goes the cessation of contact and then the cessation of kamma. So you long, no longer make contact and therefore you no longer make kamma. And just this Noble Eightfold Path, so right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, that is the path of practice leading to the cessation of kamma. So when we walk the Noble Eightfold Path, when we develop the Noble Eightfold Path, then this is how we actually come to the cessation of kamma. So this is another way of actually looking and, and deepening our practice. So I offer this as the answer to the question and we can share the blessings with all sentient beings. May all beings be happy and well in gladness and safety. Maybe they be free from suffering and blessings of the triple gem. Wishing you all well. Teruan Saranai.